This is Rebecca Lavoie, and I will be hosting the Undisclosed Addendum episodes on the Pam Lanier case. You might know me as the audio producer for Undisclosed, but I'm also a journalist, the author of several true crime books, and host of the podcast Crime Writers On, which uh, one of our panelists, Rabia, often says is one of her favorites. Our special guest for this edition of Hello, Addendum, yes. <laughs> thanks, Rabia. Our special guest for this edition of Addendum is Steve Fishman. He's an award winning author and journalist. For many years, he was a contributing editor for New York Magazine, and recently, he is the voice and creator behind podcasts. His first hit was Ponzi Supernova, a six episode audio series about Bernie Madoff, and then Empire on Blood, a six-part series about justice in the Bronx is his current hit podcast. Over the course of his career, Steve has covered the criminal justice system, including wrongful convictions, corrupt officials, financial misdeeds. He has a distinctive noir voice, and he also owns a bar in Brooklyn (laughs) called Irv's, which is one of my favorite things about him. Steve, thank you so much for joining Addendum. Well, thanks for having me. I, I hope we get to meet at Irv sometime soon. I hope so, too. <laughs> also with us is Rabia Chaudhry. She's one of the hosts of Undisclosed. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, A Non-Story, and a co-host of the 45th podcast. And as of last week, she is one of the partners at Chaudhry and Anwar, an immigration law firm. Congratulations on your new venture, Rabia, and thank you for talking to me. Thank you. I'm so excited. I did not know that was going to be part of the intro. Uh, I'm still getting used to it myself. <laughs> and I just realized... We get discounts on drinks at Irv's with a with a certain password. Is that right? <laughs> well, I'm not. Well, I'm not alcoholic, well, but uh, what can I get? Well, we, <laughs> That's what I want. You'll, you'll bring we, friends. We cater to all. We, can, we cater to all tastes. Awesome. Uh, and and actually, we're running a little trivia contest about Empire on Blood now. You you have to answer in the fifth episode what is the private detective's favorite drink, hmm. and then you get a oh, discount on that drink. I used to live about 10 blocks north of where Irv's is in Brooklyn, so. That's interesting. Is that right? Where? Uh, I lived right there at sort of the corner of Eastern Parkway and Washington Avenue in, you know, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights. There you go. Yeah, you would. we would be one of your local watering holes. We're sorry you left. <laughs> the onion, the, the layers of the onion that is Colin Miller continue to unpeel. Uh, Colin Miller is, of course, <laughs> a lot of lives. <laughs> he is one of the hosts of Undisclosed. He's the blog editor of Evidence Prof Blog, and he's a law professor and associate dean at the University of South Carolina School of Law and my favorite legal Siri. And he also is the writer and producer behind the Pam Lanier series. So this week, the Undisclosed Disclosed team did kick off this new series covering this case. Pam Lanier was convicted in 2001 of murder in connection with the death of her husband Dorian through arsenic poisoning. The first episode of the series focused on the death of Pam's previous husband, Johnny Ray, who drowned in the canal behind their trailer in Surf City, North Carolina. While Johnny Ray's death was ruled accidental and his post-exhumation autopsy didn't reveal elevated levels of arsenic, the prosecutor made her previous husband's death the centerpiece of its case against Lanier under an evidentiary principle known as the doctrine of chances. Now, Steve, I'm just going to take a step aside here just for undisclosed listeners who haven't yet heard Empire on Blood. Of course, we talked about it and gave it four thumbs up on the Crime Writers On podcast. We really enjoyed it. Um, yes. What can you tell us about your podcast and the case inside of it, the, the Calvin Buari case? Well, maybe the place to start is where I began, which was with a phone call seven years ago. Uh, one I was not looking forward to or, or expecting to change my life, but but did. Um, on the other end was a guy named Calvin Buari, calling collect from a New York State Correctional Institution. And um, Rebecca, as you mentioned, I'd covered wrongful convictions, I'd covered crime. So, you know, from time to time, I would uh, inmates would reach out to me with claims of innocence. And, you know, there'd be thick envelopes of documents. And, and, you know, you guys all know it's it's extremely complicated, extremely time consuming. And I had other things I felt I needed to do. And and as my my friend email, a former convict who was actually exonerated, told me, you know, everybody in prison is innocent. So I guess I justified my my action that way or my lack of action. But with Cal. Calvin Buari who called me, there was, there was actually something different. First of all, Emel, who I just mentioned, had vouched for him. He thought that Cal was innocent of this double homicide 
which had been committed when I spoke to him uh, a, a decade and a half earlier. And so Cal starts racing through the evidence of his innocence. And, and you know, he's known this case. He's inside. It's very difficult to follow. But there's something for me extraordinarily compelling in his his voice. And, you know, I, I, I suppose I still can't explain it, but I, I had this image of this guy standing at a prison payphone and and trying to run a campaign for his freedom. And and to me, that was quite moving. And then the, the, the next thing that happened is I said, Cal, you know, and, and you guys have done this, but I mean, I, I didn't say yes. What I what I said was I, I didn't say no. I said, you know, Cal, send me the transcripts. And and, and that really was the moment um, th- that changed me, that made me open to this case. I mean, 1,100 pages. You guys have read them. I mean, transcripts are can be fantastic reading. I mean, they're a drama with players and dialogue. And as I'm reading this, I'm starting to think. Um, Wait, this is justice. Yeah. I, I, I mean, perhaps, perhaps I was naive then, but just two two examples of kind of what was revealed to me in that transcript. The first is, and listen, everybody knows that that people get deals for testifying for the state, but here you have four of Cal's previous associates. I should mention Cal was an admitted crack dealer. Four of his previous drug associates, all facing criminal charges, walk in. The prosecutor says, no jail time. Just say what we need you to say. Now, one of those guys is actually in prison. And the prosecution, using its its long arm, manages to, to expedite his release from prison. Hmm. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I think to the average person will – will seem unfair. I understand the prosecution will tell you all the reasons for it, but that was the first thing. And the second thing was that the prosecutor declared in advance that Cal, the defendant, was so dangerous that the prosecution needed an order of protection for its witnesses. Mm -hmm. Now, that meant that the defense Cal's attorney could not know the names, could not even know the names of any of the people who would testify against him until they walked to the witness stand. Now, I, you know, I don't really think it needs a, a legal expert to feel like, how, how am I going to prepare for a case? How am I going to defend myself and my life when I really don't even know who's going to testify against me? You know, those things together, I mean, they that's what really set me on the path to kind of get to the bottom of the, right. uh, of this case. Right. And I understand that you, you know, pitched this case as a magazine story. It was rejected because Cal was seen as an admitted drug dealer who helped bring crack to the Bronx as an unsympathetic character in the story. I have experience with that. You know, as an author, we've pitched magazine stories and even books to our uh, publisher, you know, book proposals that have been rejected because the, you know, protagonist or the person at the center of it, even the victim in some cases, isn't seen as somebody relatable and sympathetic enough, you know, to appeal to an audience, to make an audience care. So, you know, you're kind of balancing those things in your storytelling. I think you do a really good job of making the case that, you know, put that aside here. Like, let's listen to the story of what happened in the system. But I've always wondered with the Undisclosed team, you know, Colin and Rabia, do you make those kinds of choices when you're choosing which cases to cover? Have you ever had a case that was really compelling, but you thought, how do we make our audience care about what happened to this person? Um, I think, you know, there have been a couple of times when we have been a little bit worried about the nature of the crimes, like, for example, if it's involved um, children as victims mm-hmm. and sexual assault and, and murder. I mean, I think it is harder to have a to get a sympathetic ear in that situation because people are overwhelmed with the enormity of the crime and the, you know, the gruesomeness of it. And I think kind of like what happened with the West Memphis three case, that that becomes kind of paramount. And so I don't think we've ever rejected anything outright because of that. Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know we have had conversations about that. So far, 
I mean, when you look at, for example, Joey Watkins, he had a bit of a reputation. It was kind of based on nothing, but he had a little bit of a reputation. We've had um, defendants that have had some issues. We, you know, a number of the defendants out of Philadelphia have had some minor, uh, you know, criminal infractions, um, some interactions with the law, but nothing major. Yeah, and that's actually the origin of this series is that I saw a case in the news being handled by the Wake Forest Innocence and Justice Clinic and reached out to Mark Rabel about it. He said, you know, I think there is a decent chance that this guy's innocent, but he has sort of a sordid history. He wouldn't come off as that sympathetic. But I do have this other client, Pam Lanier, and we have a strong belief in her innocence. And I think that if you are able to talk with her and get her recorded, she'll come off very sympathetic. And so that's actually a big part of the origin of this series was it was another case that we decided not to pursue that led us to this one. Hmm. And the interviews that we hear with you and Pam, you went to prison to visit her, correct? Right. Went to Troy, North Carolina last week. She is there in a women's prison. Actually, they're going to be bringing some men in and moving them, I think, to either Charlotte or Goldsboro in North Carolina. But right, I did go up and talk with her about two hours last week. You know, that was that's a profound question, both in terms of, you know, guilt and innocence in some very large sense, but it, and also in terms of storytelling mm-hmm. where, Rebecca, as you point out, you have to win the sympathy of the audience. You you need somebody to kind of take this journey with you. And I think that my, my magazine editors thought, you know, okay, here's a crack dealer who may or may not be guilty of a murder, you know, let's move on. But in the end, I think the podcast really works in part because you, you know, you are invited into what's a morally complicated universe, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it would be great to have an honor student and a Boy Scout or Girl Scout who's, you know, falsely accused. But, you know, real life is quite different. And what we're really asking people to do is almost put aside the character of the person, you know, put aside their past. And let's see what the justice system did, because, you know, that's really the other side of this equation. I mean, the, the question that, that we pose very explicitly is, can you seek conviction over justice? Can you convict a guy with the thought in mind, you know, if he didn't do this one, he did another. Right. And, you know, I think I think finally you have to say no to that. And I, and I think that that's in some way the kind of the ruling determination uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to the background of a of a defendant. I started reading The Economist when I did extemporaneous speaking in high school, and I've been a regular reader ever since. And that's because The Economist is about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from politics and business to science, technology, arts, and the environment. As I've noted before, I'm working on a bill that would provide compensation to the wrongfully convicted in South Carolina, and a really influential article in that effort is one in The Economist about how Texas is the most generous state in the country when it comes to compensating the wrongfully convicted. Given the many intersections between money and criminal justice, it's not surprising that The Economist covers a wide range of subjects that are likely to interest you as listeners, from private prisons, to false confessions, to mass incarceration. The Economist is the smart guide to the forces changing our world. And now, undisclosed listeners, you can get your free copy of The Economist by visiting economist.com slash undisclosed. That's economist.com slash undisclosed. Enter your details for a free copy delivered directly to your door. Now, one of the things that I I want people to know if they haven't yet listened to Empire on Blood is that I think the way you overcome that challenge, Steve, on the storytelling side, I mean, I am in no way saying that a crack dealer isn't 100 percent as deserving of a fair trial and a fair process as anybody else. That is completely true, obviously. But in terms of the sellability of a story and the appeal of a story, for those of you who haven't listened to Empire and Blood, you think maybe like listening to a story about the wrongful conviction of an admitted crack dealer may not be for me. I will tell you what Steve does that so makes it work. To me, it's it's the magic of the whole thing is that you have a relationship with him. You reveal something that I think a lot of journalists don't do in their reporting on stories like that. And you don't hide the fact that in order to really like tell someone's story over a period of years, you do build a sincere relationship with him and you put that in the podcast. So you become the audience's conduit to 
caring. You know, we think immediately, we hear you care, and maybe that wouldn't come across in print as well. We hear you care, and then we care as well, because if you care, there must be something to care about. I mean, at least that that was my takeaway from it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And, you know, you're right. I think I've been criticized a little bit because, you know, I've abandoned a certain kind of journalistic objectivity with objectivity in quotes. Um, you know, this was a seven year story and I've, I've always felt, and, and this may sound stupid in, in isolation, but, you know, journalism is a, okay. It's a pursuit of the truth. It's also a kind of act of empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into other people's worlds and how do you enter those worlds? Well, I think that the, the real thing, the leap you have to take is you have to make yourself identify with those worlds. Right. Now, there are built-in limits, racial and ethnic and age and all those. But the, the, the kind of act of it, the effort of it, I, I think it pays off. Right. And so I have a real relationship with Cal. And Cal and I, you know, we laugh together. We chat kind of ridiculously about, I mean, we trade remedies for cold. And Cal tells me how he makes a concoction that cures him of colds in prison. So, you know, there's this kind of relationship that goes from the very casual to the very intense. Because, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, without without kind of creating too many spoilers, there's this moment that Cal gets this huge break. He's been in prison 15 years, and he finally lines up an attorney. And it's not just any attorney. It's a guy named Byron Beldock, who really was responsible for freeing Hurricane Carter after he was convicted of a triple murder. And this guy, he, he really almost literally comes off his deathbed. He's 80, 85 years old. He's got heart problems. He's got cancer. And basically he says, you know, Cal's going to be my last crusade. Right. Um, and, and this guy has, you know, he has the tools and the heft and the, the reputation to do it. And he doesn't make it. Yeah. He writes the appeal but he doesn't make it to the finish line. And because of my relationship with Cal, Cal calls me. Here's a rumor of this. And he said, is it true that Myron passed? So, you know, I was the one who told him that. Now, you know, for the, for the storytelling in the podcast, I think, yeah, that's a key moment. But it's also like this, this moment in our relationship right. where I, I think you, you do get to hear that there are things we're sharing. There is an emotional connection. And, you know, I don't want to overemphasize that our lives could not be more different. Right. You know, right. I made my living, you know, cutting neighbors lawns. Right. So, right. Well, <laughs> I mean, as a teenager. Yeah. You know. I mean, that is the human connection. But I also think and, you know, we'll have to move on after this, you know, but I do think, I mean, Sarah Kane got a lot of criticism after Serial for what, you know, people who listened heard as a friendliness between her and her subject, Adnan Syed. It's something you hear over and over and over again. And her response to that question is, there's a difference between um, what journalists do and what they show you they do. And so the objectivity quotient, when you're covering a story like that and you use that word objectivity in quotes, it's kind of a bullshit premise. It is your choice as a journalist to show it if it benefits the story. And I think in your case... It does, and it would have been disingenuous to not show it, and it doesn't mean that what you did wasn't journalism. I stand by that. As a journalist by day, I 100% stand by that. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you, and I, I know we want to move on. Let me just say one more thing, which is that that was a choice that I made because you're right, in print, that never gets in. Right. It, when I say that, I mean the relationship, the way that somebody, the reason somebody talks to you, you know, the either, you know, fraudulent emotion or real emotion you bring to it. And that, you know, that's one of the things that really underpins journalism. And I'm a recent convert to audio, but one of the things that I love about it is that it feels like the whole scaffolding of journalism, it, it becomes more transparent and that's something I've always wanted to do and experience. And I think, you know, putting it before the listener, you know, you can decide, you know, mm -hmm. am I too friendly? Has it warped my view or, or is this, or is this how the sausage is made? And, right. And are these real feelings that, you know, that show up and get translated? Absolutely. Can I just say one thing? Go ahead. Can I just say one thing? The perspective that's just kind of missing from this, although I totally appreciate and understand how, you know, this medium is showing the bones here and how the sausage is made is that 
the sausage is also made out of people and the people on the end are often the subjects like in you know cereal's case it was adnan and it can get very complicated for mm-hmm. a person who is the subject of this kind of story especially when it's a long term relationship right i'm like well, how do you end up defining that relationship is this really a friendship or not and i think right. that's where for me the moral crisis comes in not so much how much, how is the audience going to understand this relationship? But how is the subject understanding the relationship? Right. No, I agree. And I had that experience uh, with a long term interview series with somebody who was in prison that didn't end well. I mean, I think we both made mistakes in terms of boundaries. And it was, you know, it was hard. It was really hard for me. It was hard for him. It's especially hard for me because I know he's going to get out at some point and he's probably going to live in the town where I live when he does because he's oh, from God. the town where I live. So, you know, time will tell. But but it is something we obviously we have to think about. And I think, Colin, you know, I will tell you, you obviously went there as somebody do, like recording an interview. And those are the clear sort of parameters when you went in. You'll be fine, Colin. I, I think you will. <laughs> 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 but I, I do want to ask you, Colin, because the whole uh, framework around this episode is around this doctrine of chances. That's where it begins with that amazing Bruce Willis quote, by the way, from Die Hard 2. And you talk about that. But you've also previously talked about MO or modus operandi evidence. What is the difference between those two things? Yes, we break that down. First of all, what we call propensity character evidence is inadmissible. So you can't say once a killer, always a killer, or once a rapist, always a rapist. Modus operandi is Latin. It stands for method of working. And a good example is the case that just broke today, the Golden State Killer. This is a man who had a very distinctive way of committing his crimes. He would pry open windows. He would shine flashlights into the faces. He would tie up the victims. He would put teacups or plates on the male victims' backs and say if they moved and caused noise, he would kill everyone. And so basically the theory of modus operandi is to say there is a distinctive way in which a series of crimes were committed. Think Jack the Ripper think the Golden State Killer. And so we're not claiming once a rapist, always a rapist, or once a killer, always a killer. We're saying these crimes are so distinctive that if we can prove this person committed one of these crimes, he must have been the person who committed all of them. Doctrine of Chance, as you said with the Bruce Willis quote, is essentially saying, look, there's this series of strange occurrences that have occurred in this person's life. A series of fires, a series of drownings, multiple people dead at the bottom of a staircase. And we're not saying they caused any of those But what are the odds that this person would have all these calamities in their life and they would all be accidental? And we sort of give it to the jury and say, you know, take it for what it's worth. Do you think this evidence shows a pattern or not? We're not saying it does. We're not saying this person acted in bad faith. But if you want to draw that inference, you can do so. Yeah. And as you know, from listening to my podcast in the Michael Peterson case, the staircase case, that's the inference that Toby Ball, my co-panelist, draws all the time, that he knew two women who were found dead at the bottom of staircases. And that that's a little too weird for him, right? I mean, that's what the Doctrine of Chances is, right? Exactly. And as I sort of previewed a bit in this episode, the same attorneys at the same firm were handling the appeals in both of these cases at the same time. And so Mm. as we progress along, we'll go into some more detail on the Michael Peterson case. But there are some pretty strong parallels between the two cases and reasons to believe that that case is going to help Pam Lanier to eventually be released. Rabia, what do you think about this idea of the Doctrine of Chances being used as part of a prosecution? I'm kind of conflicted on it. Um, I think it's, you know, from a strictly legal standpoint, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily equitable to use it, but as a human being, it would make sense to me to be presented with evidence of something, you know, similar that happened in this person's orbit or life. Uh, Honestly, I'm just a little conflicted. I think it's the kind of thing that has to be um, done with, I mean, like in this case, in Pam's case, I don't think it was properly used, but you know, so it, it just has to be done like in such a careful manner to make sure that, you know, these kinds of really leaping associations aren't made that actually where there's actually no connection. And right. I think that's what happened in Pam's case. I'm surprised to hear you say that you feel conflicted about it because when Colin was describing it, I was actually thinking of another way that it's used outside of the courtroom, and it's very often used with skeptics talking about cases. And I think about in Serial Season 1, the producer Dana Chivas talking about you know her leaning toward Adnan being guilty because he just couldn't be that unlucky. And she's tying these like unrelated, to me, unrelated facts together 
um, yeah. that, you know, be, just because she has the perception that this would have had to have happened and this would have had to have happened. Right. And, and it kind of feels the same to me. No, I think there's a, a real distinction here. I think that is different. I think that is, you know, a set of facts that all kind of that you can read together to mean something, right. which is what happens over and over in wrongful convictions is different than an event that is almost exactly the same happening in a person's life. Right. right. I mean, like somebody who's connected to you dying mysteriously, being assaulted and one, like, you know what I mean? So for example, I mean, like whether you're talking about a perpetrator of domestic violence or any other kind of has a propensity for any other kind of violence or crime, you do often see a history of it. Right. Like it does repeat. So I think that's different than just pulling together random events in a person's life and making them mean something. Right, right. So, Steve, uh, what do you think about this doctrine of chances and how it played into this case? Well, having listened to that first episode, which, by the way, I thought was gripping, um, one of the red herrings here is that I, I thought that the first episode showed that, that the doctor, doctrine of chances didn't actually apply in this case. It, it seems right. pretty clear that, uh, that Pam's what they refer to as their first husband, which I guess is her third husband, is not killed in the same way as the husband for, for whom she's on trial. So mm. it, it, it was kind of fascinating that the prosecution was able to use that and really, you know, a, a bit dishonestly, it seems, because the prosecution obviously knew that the claims in the two cases were very, very different. Uh, so it, it was surprising to me that, that the defense didn't make a bigger issue of it and that the the jury didn't see through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering, Colin, maybe this is like asking you for a spoiler, but isn't the same true in the Michael Peterson case that the first woman, the woman in Germany, didn't die from falling down the stairs? She was just found dead at the bottom of stairs. Like she had an aneurysm or something, right? No one claimed that anyone hit her with a stick and <laughs> pushed her downstairs. Well, that's the interesting thing, which is one of the distinctions between the two is, you know, obviously, as we discussed in this episode, Johnny Ray's drowning is deemed accidental. He's exhumed. And that holding is corroborated by the post-exhumation autopsy that says, yeah, this was an accidental drowning. There's not elevated levels of arsenic. Elizabeth Ratliff, that woman who died at the bottom of the staircase in Germany, Initially, her death was ruled accidental. They then exhume her body and bring it back to the U.S. when he's being prosecuted for the death of his wife. And they have a new autopsy, and the determination is she died from blunt force trauma to the head, which hmm. was the same cause of death as his wife, Elizabeth. Right. So that's a bit of a distinction wherein it was still doctrine of chances in that case because we didn't know whether Michael Peterson is the one who caused that harm. But there was this post-exhumation autopsy that says, actually, this was a killing in bad faith. We can't say it's Michael Peterson, but it was blunt force trauma to the head and not a fall down the staircase. Right. Now, Colin, you made a stylistic choice in covering this story, um, one that I really appreciate in that you didn't just tell us that Pam Lanier's case was featured on the terrible uh, investigation discovery show, Deadly <laughs> Women. You actually used clips from the show instead of just explaining what the state's case was. You said, um, you know, it was the same as it was in the show. So let's just play the clips from the show to tell you what the state said. Talk about Deadly Women and, you know, how her story's appearance on that show makes the public feel about this case? Like, what impact do you think a show like that has? I mean, it just completely colors how anyone hearing about the case would think about it. I mean, she is clearly portrayed as this gold-digging black widow who marries men for their money and then kills them in cold blood. And it's just so far apart from the actual facts in this case and how everyone I've talked to speaks about Pam Lanier and this relationship. And so certainly, you know, anyone coming into this case, having watched the video, is going to have preconceived notions. And that's, again, as we touched upon a bit in the episode, it's made a lot of people I talk to gun shy. At first, they don't want to talk to me because they have seen what happened with this episode and, and see the impact it's had on people both in the community and online when they're talking about Pam and her case. Yeah. Now, Robbie, you were colored. Your perception of, of the case was colored a little bit when you watched the episode, right? Oh, not a little bit, completely. <laughs> I, I watched that, and see, Colin has been producing and investigating. I watched that, and I was like, we're doing this case? Why are we doing this case? <laughs> it's, 
it's really it's so troubling um, how coverage like that can just really impact um, people and completely, completely distract from and not even be based on facts. I mean, like I was troubled by it. I watched it, but I thought there's no way Colin's going to invest us in a case where like, you know, there's not some real evidence right. that this, this uh, woman is innocent. So, but yeah, there were, there were things about that video that, and, and I was telling Colin later um, that, you know, even now when we talk about the facts of the case, even though I know they're really very different than what was portrayed, it is hard for me to get the, those images out of my head. Right. When I think about Johnny's mm-hmm. drowning, I still see the clip in my head from that video. Right. And, uh, and I wish I didn't. Yeah. Now you in the Ronnie Long series, it was noted, you know, which you produced, I believe it was noted that jurors can be seated despite having pre-existing familiarity with the case, as long as they say they can put aside their initial impressions. So do you think if Pamela Neer were to receive a new trial and you were, if you lived in that state to get a jury notification and you were asked to serve on that jury and you were not, you know, struck because you have a true crime podcast and you're a lawyer, um, do you think you could be fair and impartial after watching that episode of Deadly Women? I mean, you know, it would it would really depend. This is the problem. I mean, if I had watched it, what my <laughs> my reaction would depend on what actually happens in the courtroom. Right. Right. I mean, are you going to have competent counsel who can deconstruct all that right. or not? Right. Um, and I don't always trust that. So I would say strike anybody who's seen that episode. <laughs> right. Now, Steve, have you seen any of this kind of true crime media, this very pulpy, over dramatized with lots of recreations, true crime media like Deadly Women before? Sure. Um, I'm sure we've all seen a bit of it. I I mean, uh, for me, not having seen this particular one, um, I find it easy to believe that people could discount what the media claims, Mm. uh, you know, being on the receiving end of a lot of criticism about journalism. Um, And, you know, you don't have to go so far as to believe that all negative news is fake news. But there is a, a way in which I think for instance, my experience listening to this podcast and the investigation and the real evidence, I found that convincing. Mm-hmm. And it, it certainly didn't matter to me that there was dramatic music and overacting in the uh, Black Widow's right. narrator's voice. So I'll say that. You know, the, the other thing that I was going to mention is in, in terms of the doctrine of chances, in in the podcast case that I was looking at, it was actually the defendant who was suggesting that the that the doctrine of chance is applied. Hmm. This is Cal, and he spent basically his entire adult life claiming that his former protege, Dwight, was actually the killer. Mm-hmm. And the reason he puts forth, or one of the reasons that he's put forth is that Two years after the murder in question, after the murder for which Cal went to prison, two years later, there was another murder committed in almost the exact same way, and Dwight was convicted of that murder. Yeah. So Cal's contention is, you know, lightning doesn't strike twice. Yep. And sit up and take notice. Right. Right. And this is what we in the uh, evidence field call reverse 404B evidence. So 404B, rule 404B is the rule that allows for evidence to come in under MO or doctrine of chances. And then reverse 404B is exactly like in Cal's case, where you say, I was convicted of something. There was a very similar crime. We can prove who committed that crime. And that means it's likely they committed this crime as well. And so, yeah, that was really interesting to hear how that played into Cal's case. Yeah. It didn't play into Cal's case. And, you know, that was one of the extraordinarily frustrating things for Cal is that he could never get any traction because the the system, you know, likes finality. It doesn't want to look at itself and it certainly doesn't want to reverse itself. So as an extreme example of this, in Cal's case, there's actually somebody who confesses to the murder for which Cal went to prison. He confesses 10 years uh, after Cal goes to, to prison for it. And and yet you see the the kind of momentum rally and, and impulses of the justice system come together and basically say, this can't be true. It can't be true because somebody doesn't confess to murder, just raise their hand and say, hey, I did it, you know, take me away. And second of all, because, you know, Cal's a bad guy. We've proven this. So we're, we're really not going to take this seriously. 
And in fact, what you what you see is, it, it, I mean, it's in the podcast, the detective who goes by the nickname Father Frank because he happens to be good at getting confessions. Father Frank goes to the person who confessed and says, you know, that's a stupid idea. You didn't really do these murders, did you? No. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. It's more elaborate. And Father Frank brings the guy's mother in and there's all kinds of, a, you know, it's an emotionally fraught situation. But it, it is pretty interesting that, you know, despite what you would say would be obvious evidence worth pursuing, the criminal justice system looks at these things through a a set of eyes that uh, come with preconceived ideas. And, and I think they're very difficult to overcome for the justice system. They are, except for that one amazing moment in your podcast where the prosecutor at the hearing tries to um, paint Cal as this dangerous criminal because he's the drugs and like the wish is using all this war on drugs language. And, you know, was it somebody says to her, what, this isn't like the 1990s. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> that seemed like a rare moment of insight in these kinds of procedures. I was really impressed by that. Yeah, I was, too. That was the defense attorney. He was very, very good on his feet. And, <laughs> you, you know, that I mean, that's the other thing that happens in this particular case, you know, is it emanates from the 90s. 90s are very different in New York. There are 2,000 murders a year. It's extreme. You know, people are saying we're going to lose the city. We can't live here. It's under siege. And there's Giuliani becomes mayor. And his dictate is, you know, bring order to the streets. Yep. That goes down the chain. You know, the prosecutors, you know, and the prosecutors spoke at length. It's this character I call Turtle Man because he's got like 20 turtles running free in his house. He, uh, you know, he's he's not a bad guy. But nobody, I, I don't think anybody really sets out to do wrong in these cases. But, you know, at some early point, he identifies himself as a good guy. And fascinatingly to me, because I've covered this for a while, being a good guy means getting Cal off the streets, mm-hmm. you know. He was identified in the press as a target. He was identified by task forces as a target. So you had this system where the the good guys already had their sights set on somebody before, it seems to me, before kind of sifting through the evidence. And maybe it was the 90s that favored that because of the state of New York City, or maybe it was just some kind of glitch in judgment. But I think one of the things that happens is you get a a lot of people uh, or let's say some number of people who are swept up in this good guy fervor who actually aren't bad guys or who aren't guilty of what they're convicted of. A lot of our listeners first got to know about me personally because of my advocacy for Adnan after the Serial podcast. But here's the thing. I couldn't have done that unless I had a website where I could blog about the case. And I didn't just want to blog. I needed my own website where I could do it so I could control how, when, where, how much I wanted to share, what documents I wanted to add. And that's why Squarespace is so important. Squarespace is the tool that allows people like me who are kind of low skill on the tech side but have something to say, have issues that mean something to them. It gives us a platform. But Squarespace is not just about, of course, blogging and advocacy. I mean, there's so many things you can do with your own website. You can turn a cool idea into a website, showcase your work. Maybe you're an artist or an artisan. Sell products and services of all kinds and you know, promote an actual business like that exists in physical space. I mean, none of this can be done unless you have a website. It's that important in today's world. Squarespace makes it easy for you because they've got gorgeous templates that are already ready to go. They're created by world-class designers. You just click and, I mean, like I said, somebody like me could do it. It's that easy. And they've got a great, powerful e-commerce functionality that lets you sell anything online too. You can customize the look and feel. You can fix your settings and make your products look how you want. Again, just a few clicks. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box as well. 
They've even got analytics that help you grow in real time, which are really important to me because I check my analytics all the time to make sure I know uh, when I get traffic, where it comes from, what makes people interested. And so, you know, I can be better at what I'm doing online. And with Squarespace, you never have to patch or upgrade anything ever. And they've got 24 seven award-winning customer support. So right now you can head over to squarespace.com slash undisclosed for a free trial. And when you are ready to launch, use the offer code undisclosed to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash undisclosed. Get a free trial, design a website, and right before you're ready to launch, use the offer code undisclosed to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name. Your destiny is calling you and it says you need a new website. So make it with Squarespace. I want to go back to the show Deadly Women for a minute. Um, it's been running for 11 seasons. It's really popular for anybody not familiar with these investigation discovery type shows. They're on other networks as well. It is part of a long lived genre of true crime that, in my opinion, and I've given interviews about this before, likes to cast women in a certain light, whether it's women victims or women perpetrators. And in these shows, these women are often shown in overly dramatic recreations, wearing lingerie, uh, heavily made up. <laughs> Usually the actresses cast in these recreations are much more attractive and salacious in appearance than the actual real life women that they're uh, portraying. There is this, I think, desire around crimes involving women to use these stereotypes. And you talked about the Black Widow. And that also came up, that same Black Widow stereotype came up in a case that my husband Kevin wrote about, the Sheila Labar case in his book, Wicked Intentions. And I should say, he has appeared on the show Deadly Women, I think multiple times, and on other shows just like it, talking about that very case. As a true crime author, like that is the media that you're offered. I just hate to tell you, I've been on some of these shows, too. And when you're sitting there doing your interview, like in a hotel room with the film crew, giving your little sound bites, you just know, like, OK, there's going to be like a woman in lingerie behind my head as I'm, <laughs> as I'm explaining this. <laughs> but it's not good. I don't think it's good. I've actually really stepped back. I, I think that the rise of true crime podcasting has brought these kinds of stories more to the mainstream and that we don't have the same kind of pressure to do these stupid TV shows <laughs> that we used to have. But, yeah, I, I don't think that they're good. So I just wanted to go on record as having said that. Um, now, it was noted on the episode that the medical examiner concluded that Johnny Ray, uh, the earlier husband of Pam, had arsenic levels within a normal range, but toward the upper end of that range, with the ultimate conclusion being that his arsenic levels were normal, not a contributing factor in his drowning. Despite this fact, Pam's attorneys did not present any evidence about that exhumation and autopsy because they feared jurors would get confused or they just didn't trust the jury. Now, we know this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but um, I'm curious, what does everybody think of that decision by her attorney? Steve, um, going through everything related to Cal's trial, were there decisions his attorneys made that you're like, why would they do that or not do that? Well, you know, in retrospect, uh, you have to say yes. Um, you know, in Cal's case, kind of going back to the fact that he he really was hamstrung in terms of investigating the witnesses. I think that what his defense really lacked and his defense attorney really couldn't marshal was a, a thorough investigation of the night of the crime. Um, you know, and maybe he should have done that. I mean, there was, there was no protective order on the crime scene or on the neighbors, because this murder happens on a crowded street. It's like six yards from the corner on blood is a local newspaper dubbed this, this intersection where there are a lot of murders. It's an open air drug market. It's evening of a nice day. So there are lots of people around. So the thing that really never happened was a very thorough canvassing of of the scene. And what happens 20 years later, when Cal finally gets an appeal and his day in court, is that you have people who were at the scene two decades earlier, who now come forward and testify. And so is that at the foot of the defense attorney? Maybe, but, but I think the point here is that 
you know, the evidence was was always there to be got. Mm -hmm. What made it not be gotten? You know, you can go back and forth on that. But I, I mean, I think one of the tragedies in cases like this is that the the ultimate result was always there to be to be found. Mm -hmm. And it just took two, three decades. Yeah. Now, Robbie, you've spent many, many years I'm not going to use the term Monday morning quarterbacking, challenging the uh, choices made by the defense attorney in the case that you've been talking about, Anand Syed's case. What do you think of this decision by Pam's attorneys just to not present this fairly compelling evidence they had that this is not, in fact, how her first husband died? Uh, I think it was a clearly a poor choice. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I seem to see this a lot that, you know, uh, trial attorneys will think that the jury is not sophisticated or smart enough or whatever to follow some evidence. Well, that's your job. Your job is to present it in a way that it's clear and compelling and, un, you know, and completely certain to them that they know what's going on. Your job is otherwise, I mean, that you can't, I, I just don't understand. To me, that's like, that's ineffective assistance of counsel, like at its core. I've got great compelling evidence that shows my client's innocence. I'm not going to show it to the jury. I don't even understand. I, I don't know how that, but I, this is not an area of law I've ever practiced. And your job is to figure out how to make it, make it so that they can understand it. How do you fit the pieces? And, you know, at the end of the day, what I've realized with, when it comes to trial, it's about who tells a better story, who tells it more clearly, um, and who tells a compelling narrative. And, Again, if, if you can't do it, then get out of the work. Yeah. What do you think, Colin? Yeah, I mean, it's really tough because I can understand their perspective of saying we're already spending a bunch of time on Johnny Ray's drowning. We'd want to call more attention to it. And there is some confusing evidence with regard to the arsenic levels. On the other hand, you know, what I've seen, I guess, over the course of my career is that in the absence of a negative, jurors speculate. When a person doesn't testify, they don't respect that instruction not to hold it against them. When mm -hmm. insurance is not mentioned, they speculate and talk about whether there was insurance. I think the decision the attorneys made here was if we don't have any discussion of arsenic levels in Johnny Ray, the jurors are not going to consider that. They're going to think, oh, there must not have been arsenic. I think probably the opposite happened. I think the fact that there's not a discussion of lack of elevated arsenic levels, and Johnny Ray led them to speculate, well, maybe she poisoned him too. He was in a confused state. He drowned in shallow water. There's no drowning expert. And I just think they had some pretty strong conclusions there from the experts saying these levels are not elevated. It's not the cause of death. It's an accidental drowning. I just think you have to draw that out. And it might take a while. It might be tough. But I think there are ways to explain that to the jury in an effective way. And I think that was a real missed opportunity. Especially when it's the core of the state's case, right? I mean, that's the core of the state's evidence against your client. Uh, I think that it's their duty to refute that. One of the things that I thought was interesting listening to the tape as I was putting this episode together was, Rabia, you had questions about the details of Johnny Ray's drowning. You had those questions yourself about him drowning in shallow oh, yeah. water. You know, yeah. she couldn't swim, but who wouldn't jump in and save him? And, you know, I wanted to ask you, actually, have you ever known an adult who didn't know how to swim? Because the ones that I've known who don't know how to swim, there's no freaking way they would jump in water of any kind, even if it was to save somebody. So I am an adult who does not know how to swim. Really? But... I don't know. I can only flail and then drown. Uh, I can't really? swim. I can't even float. I cannot even float. It's a long story. I'll tell you it one day. But anyway, um, no, I can't. But for again, maybe it's because I'm making that connection to that stupid video yeah. or the fact that, you know, we keep hearing that it was shallow water. And when I asked Colin, he said it's about chest deep. I thought, well, nobody's asking you to swim. Just walk in. <laughs> you're not swimming. You're just walking into the water. This is what I was having trouble understanding yeah. about this whole thing. We did hear from that drowning expert in the episode, Colin, and, you know, let's talk about how much an expert like that could have added to this case and about defendants who can't afford experts. Like, how does it work when someone has a public defender and that public defender wants to use an expert? Yeah, so that's that's tough. And it's public defenders are 80 percent of cases and. What they can do is they can say, look, I have very limited resources, and they can ask for the judge to 
give them some money to hire an expert. There was actually a case here that involved cell terror pings, and I was working with the public defender, and they wanted to hire an expert to talk about the unreliability of cell terror pings, and it was a really tough process to get them to appoint an expert witness. So it can be very tough for someone with either a public defender or someone they're paying out of their own pocket to hire those experts. But absolutely, in this case, you know, I, I have to think strongly that a lot of people like Rabia and other people I've discussed this case with, they're looking at this and saying, he's drowning in chest deep water. Why didn't they go in and try to save him? And also, how did he drown in this shallow of water? And I myself was shocked when I was talking to the expert Fleetmeyer and he's saying, in open water drownings, it's 40 to 50% that the water is below the person's mouth. Right. And that was a shocking statistic. And I think that this case certainly could have benefited greatly from having an expert coming in and simply saying, A, 40 to 50%, they are shallow water drownings. And B, under no circumstances, and especially with them not being able to swim, should Pam and her son have tried to go in and try to save Johnny Ray. And we also got that great tip that he gave during the podcast, which is the first thing you should do if you see somebody drowning is tell them to try to stand up. <laughs> because yes. 50% of the time, statistically, they would be able to stand up. And that's something that I had never heard before. So that was fascinating. Steve, you said that Cal hadn't been able to afford the experts to do a proper investigation either, right? Yeah, I don't know if it was not so much funds as it was the approach of the defense. Right. And, you know, back to back to what we've been speaking about uh, in a previous life, I used to write about brain surgery. And one of the really frightening things that I heard again and again was that results are operator dependent, which basically means you better have a good surgeon because not every surgeon's alike. And I think that's very true of attorneys. Mm. You know, when I look at the when I read those trial transcripts, there were lots of good points made by the defense attorney, uh, you know, again and again, and again, but it didn't amount to a story. And, you know, you got to come in and you got to tell a story. You got to, you know, marshal your truth and make it present. So just the fact that you're kind of scoring points here and there, you know, not, that's not the real skill. I think the real skill is, is to come in and give a compelling narrative that explains something that the, that the jury can kind of sit and tell themselves as a bedtime story right. almost. And right. The prosecutor in this case was extremely talented at that. I mean, um, you know, he was very good. He not only won the trial, but then there was that second go round, that appeal where somebody else confessed. And the same prosecutor, Turtle Man, he goes in and undoes the confession and then really presents evidence, compelling evidence from a witness who has told one story, recanted, and then told a, another story. And somehow this guy, force of personality, the tenor of the times, he makes that believable. And I think mm. independent of the evidence, you know, and we're both talking about stories in which, you know, there's no DNA, there's there's no murder weapon. It's all, you know, he said, she said, he remembers, she remembers. And and that really lends itself to the, the skill uh, of an attorney in the courtroom. Yeah. And I will say, I know that I talk about it all the time and I hope it's not too boring for your listeners or for mine. This is why I tell everybody that if they love true crime, they should watch The Staircase because there is a look into a very well-funded, really talented defense team in that show. And they still face a lot of challenges with what appears to be all the money in the world, enough money to rebuild that stupid staircase as like a model that they drag into the courtroom. <laughs> and, you know, they have all the experts. They have Henry Lee, the most famous blood expert in the world, come in and they have a great story. And yet it doesn't go necessarily the way the audience thinks. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, now, Colin, we didn't hear much in this episode about the evidence that points to or away from Pam having having poisoned Dorian, which is the husband that she's actually in prison for killing. It's not Johnny. It's Dorian, despite the fact that Johnny's, it sounds like, was 90 percent of the content of the trial. 
I don't want you to spoil future episodes, but can you give us just like any little hint about what any evidence might look like that makes you think that like she didn't poison her husband or do you not want to share that yet? Yeah, there's another famous Latin phrase in the law. It's res ipsa loquitur, and that means the thing speaks for itself. Essentially, the state's theory at trial was Dorian was injured in a bulldozer accident about two months before he died. She was his primary caretaker, and therefore the thing speaks for itself. What else could have been the cause of his arsenic poisoning? There's no direct evidence that she poisoned him. There was no arsenic found around the house. Uh, And then those following me on Twitter, you'll see that I tweeted yesterday, so this was Tuesday. We've been looking into it, and I got new information yesterday. We think now we have found, per se, the cause of his arsenic poisoning, and that'll be a a big part of the end part of this series. Hmm. All right. Well, we do have some questions from listeners I want to get to briefly. But, Steve, before we do, do you have any questions for Colin about the case or anything we heard in the first episode? You know, Colin, here's my uh, my question. You know, as a listener, I'm I'm listening, and it's getting me angry. It's getting me frustrated. And you are extremely even voiced, even toned in this. <laughs> do you go through? Do you go through a, an emotional journey, or is there a a moment where you know you make a decision? I have to pull back and be. Uh, even toned. 